To those of you who are joining us on Facebook, a welcome. Uh, tonight we are talking about the film The Big Scary S Word and Climate Change. Uh, so we are streaming on Zoom as well as on Facebook. Uh, so if you're joining us on either stream, please feel free to uh, in, in introduce yourself in the comments, tell people your name, where you're from, and what you're most excited to win in a Green New Deal. Um, and then we'll get started in just a minute. We've got over 100 folks joining us already. Uh, great to see you all. So this is the second in a series of discussions uh, that the DSA Fund has organized around Yal Bridge's documentary film, The Big Scary S Word. Uh, tonight, the focus of our discussion is going to be on climate change. Uh, the last one was about healthcare and Medicare for all. And this event is co-sponsored by the Democratic Socialists of America Fund, Dissent Magazine, DSA's Eco-Socialist Working Group and Green New Deal Campaign Committee, the Sunrise Movement, Verso Magazine, Haymarket Books, Lux Magazine, and In These Times. And my name is Ashik Sadiq. I'll be our moderator this evening. I'm an organizer with DSA's Green New Deal campaign. Um, so we'll get started in just a few minutes uh, with words from the director of this film. Um, in the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat uh, with your name, where you're from, and what you are excited to win in a Green New Deal. And just to say a little bit about the structure of this event, we will be talking with the film's director. We'll show you a short clip and then we'll introduce the panelists and have Q&A. Uh, so uh, we can get started with a few words from Yael Bridge, who has directed this film. Uh, we're inspired by this evening, The Big Scary S Word. She is an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker. She produced Left On Purpose, winner of the Audience Award at Doc NYC. She was also the director of productions at Inequality Media, making viral videos that tackled complex political issues and has gained over 100 million views since 2016. She resides in Oakland, California. So uh, just to get started, uh, yeah, why, why this film? What brought you to, to what brought you to make a film about socialism in this historical moment? Hi. Well, I just want to thank everyone uh, first for doing this. This is just uh, an absolute um, dream. You know, you make these films by yourself for a really long time, and you wonder. Um, if anyone will ever see it, if it'll ever have an impact. And then, you know, even more so COVID hits and you just have no idea. We've been playing a bunch of festivals. Um, and I was talking today actually, and, and someone asked, so what's the audience reaction been? And I just said, I have absolutely no idea. I've never seen it with an audience. It's really actually quite depressing. Um, so being able to do an event like this is just um, so exciting because I just get to interact with people. And anyway, so why, in answer to your question, why did I, start this film, um, I think like most people, I was just really surprised by Bernie Sanders' success in the 2016 primaries, um, just came out of nowhere to, for me. Um, and I had been working on making political films and short videos in the past and thought this was, um, seemed unprecedented. I was really curious why this word, why now, what was gonna happen. Um, uh, and, and then that led to several years of, of exploration and interviews, um, my own you know, personal journey um, in figuring out the answers to those questions and then the film. So that, that was the, the genesis, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, uh, a lot of us here, like I'm an organizer with DSA, everybody here who's a panelist uh, has uh, you know, come to organizing for environmental justice in a different way with different movement relationships. Uh, so we really appreciate um, uh, the work you put into this film and the opportunity we have here to talk about all the intersections that you draw out in the film. Um, so I'm going to draw, uh, introduce folks uh, who are panelists and then we'll show you the relevant, sorry, they're zooming in the background. Um, I'm on a busy street. Um, We'll introduce the panelists and then we'll show you show a short clip and then we'll get into the discussion. Uh, so without much further ado, tonight we are very excited to have uh, some amazing organizers and activists and leaders uh, for climate and environmental, ju environmental justice. Uh, first, we have Marquita Bradshaw, a single mom who grew up in South Memphis. She's an alumna of the University of Memphis and as a non-traditional student, she worked for years in grassroots organizing around a military landfill. While doing that work, she learned from her parents that uh, the relational, relational organizing model that helped her uh, secure a historic Senate nomination uh, just uh, this past year. 
uh, Marquita's career and service have spanned labor, environment, education reform, tax reform, trade policy, and social justice work. And after making history in, in the state of Tennessee as the first black woman nominated for a statewide position, Marquita has formed Sewing Justice, a nonprofit dedicated to increasing civic engagement in communities that are experiencing environmental racism and injustice. Uh, Marquita, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, next, we have uh, Representative Ruth Buffalo, who is a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. She is originally from Mandaree, and Ruth has served in various capacities focused on building healthy and safe communities and was elected uh, into the North Dakota House of Representatives in 2018 and proudly serves the district of district, uh, serves the people of District 27 in South Fargo. Uh, welcome, Ruth. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Sorry about um, next, we have Rep Representative Janae Capella, who serves in the Hawaii State House of Representatives, where she's the vice chair for the Commun Committee of on Education. She is the first woman and native Hawaiian to represent her district and is committed to strengthening racial, gender, and economic justice throughout Hawaii and pursuing Green New Deal policies that uplift people on our planet. Uh, welcome, Janae. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, next, we have Javier Miranda, a Venezuelan American and a member of the DSA, uh, and he lives in a small apartment in St. Paul with a broke ass car. Uh, that's his, his words, not mine. He installs solar panels for a living and hopes to see a world free of borders. Welcome, Javier. Hey everyone, how's it going? Great to see you tonight. And last but not least, uh, Thea Rio Francos is an associate professor of political science at Providence College. She's the author of books including Resource Radicals from Petro Nationalism to Post Extractivism in Ecuador, and the co author of A Planet to Win Why We Need a Green New Deal. Um, along with me, she is a member of DSA's uh, Green Deal Campaign Committee. Uh, welcome, Thea. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited. Thanks to all of you. Uh, so before we get into some great conversation, I'm just going to say a little bit about how we run tonight's event. Uh, first, we're going to watch a three minute clip from the film that's relevant to the topic of tonight, uh, the climate and ecological crisis. Then the first half of the panel for about 30 minutes is going to be a discussion uh, prompt well, with some questions that I'll ask the panelists as moderator. And then in the last half for another 30 or so minutes, um, uh, We'll turn it over to questions that you ask uh, from the audience. So as we are speaking, uh, if you're on Zoom, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions uh, as they come to you throughout the discussion. Um, and uh, you're, you're free to use the Zoom chat while it's open. Uh, the chat box will be closing right now so that we can focus on part one of the discussion and it will reopen for part two of the discussion. Uh, but the Q&A box will be open the whole time uh, and we'll be tracking your questions. So without further ado, we will start with a short clip from the film, The Big Scary S Word. Um, panelists, I'll ask you to turn off your video screens so we can screen share. The biggest cost now that we confront of capitalism is it might actually destroy the possibility of human life. It's a system based on an unending, unceasing pursuit of profit, of producing ever more, throwing more and more stuff out there, no matter what the ecological cost, no matter whether we find ways of disposing of the stuff or not. And the actual strain on the planet is now coming to a point where the human species is in danger. greatest existential threat is climate change. And so to get us out of this situation, to revamp our economy, to create dignified jobs for working Americans, to guarantee health care and ele elevate our educational opportunities and attainment, we will have to mobilize our entire economy around saving ourselves and taking care of this planet. You have a situation where there is no possibility of moving away from fossil fuels. Why? Because the wealth in the oil industry is owned by a few billionaires who have no incentive to move towards renewable energy. Is that because they have low IQ and they don't get the science of climate change? Of course not, they get it completely, but it's not in their interest. Within the structure of any fossil fuel sector, 
You have the central problem of capitalism, which is the addiction to growth and profits. We have companies like Exxon and Shell who have been doing their own research for decades about the reality of climate change. They knew exactly that they, their core product was in the process of warming the planet and would do so catastrophically. But they didn't stop. In fact, they doubled down. They spread misinformation and lies and funded the whole apparatus of climate change denial. The truth is that we cannot have a lifestyle that is based on limitless growth and endless consumption and have a so-called sustainable way of life, because we live on a finite planet. The estimate that has been made is that there's something like $10 trillion worth of wealth bound up in fossil fuels. That's, you know, a massive part of the global economy. That's a huge amount of money. The crisis over climate today and the threat of ecological catastrophe requires both a social movement and ultimately a political movement that will transform the economy in a way that was very similar uh, to the abolitionist movement. Not just constricting the power of fossil fuels, but transforming the entire political economy so that it works for average citizens as opposed to large corporations and CEOs and the people at the top. It's possible to design a society and economy that is based on meeting people's most pressing needs that is also grounded in the need to protect the natural system on which all of life depends. I mean, I think the role of socialists, if we do start to see capitalism really responding to the crisis, is to push forward equity. Because if capitalism responds to this crisis, it will respond in a way that protects profits. It will not respond in a way that protects people. Who gets to live? That's the defining question of climate politics, right, is who gets to survive? All right, so that's just a taste of, of the documentary, which uh, goes into a lot of, of the other intersecting issues uh, that are, you know, the, the crises of our time and, and the, the, why, uh, as, as socialists, uh, we are organizing for a coherent vision to tackle all of them. Um, so uh, uh, we're anxious to get to as many of your questions as possible uh, in this discussion. So feel free to, uh, again, use the Q&A box to ask them. Um, we're asking the panelists to limit your their responses to three to five minutes each. Um, and I'll just start with a few questions uh, for uh, our panelists tonight. Um, so the clip begins with Vivek Chibber uh, saying that the biggest problem we confront right now is that capitalism might actually destroy the possibility of human life because it is an unceasing system of profit, no matter what the ecological costs. So as socialists, as organizers who come from different movements, um, how do we get others to understand that capitalism is not ecologically sustainable? Um, so first, uh, Thea, what are your thoughts? Big question. Um, and I think it's, it's super well posed, both, you know, the question and also the way that Vivek put it in, um, in the movie. Um, and just to kind of repeat, but expand a little bit on what he was saying. Um, on the one hand, we have a system that is predicated on limitless profit, on, on growth, on like ongoing accumulation. And on the other hand, we have a planet, right? And the planet has limits. Um, uh, it has biophysical processes, it has ecosystems, it has limited space, right? So there's a fundamental contradiction there um, between endless growth and, and the natural limits of our planet. Um, capitalism deals with this in all sorts of ways, right? Like capitalism has existed for, we could debate, right? But let's say five, 600 years. Um, and so it's come up with all sorts of ways to kind of continue to accumulate despite those limits. Um, one of the key ways that it does so, and I think this brings up the issues of, of, of global injustice and of environmental injustice is by externalizing social and environmental costs, right? By like rendering certain communities and ecosystems sacrificable, right? And by just kind of making society and nature deal with the costs of pollution, for example. So it kind of just like externalizes. That's the key way that capitalism deals with it. Though this is obviously not sustainable, right? Like you can't keep externalizing. And so 
we see in the climate crisis that it's kind of coming to a head like this, the way that capitalism endlessly accumulates doesn't think about the socio natural consequences and makes other people kind of pay for them is 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 erupting right now with the way that the climate crisis is is accelerating. Um, as socialists um, and people involved in movements, we don't want to like wait for this contradiction to play out forever, right? Like we don't want to wait for capitalism to implode on its own contradictions. Um, and so I think that that is where we're going to talk a lot more about this throughout throughout the conversation. But that's where organizing and sort of identifying those contradictions and um, using them as moments to show people how the system operates to do political education to mobilize um, and to sort of offer systemic explanations for what happens every day um, under capitalism and just to say one other quick thing and then I really want to hear from the co-panelists is that as I said like capitalism kind of comes up with ways to um, to continue to externalize its, its, its costs onto communities and onto ecosystems um, and we see how savvy capitalism is in doing that in this current evolution that we're witnessing from capitalism primarily based on fossil fuels, which it still is, but we're seeing the beginnings of what some people refer to as green capitalism, right? Which is a contradiction in terms, but it's also a real system that is emerging, right? It's kind of both of those things at the same time. So when we see um, a ways to deal with the climate crisis that rely on markets or profits, right? Or when we see very privatized approaches to um, renewable energy, right? We see the beginnings of green capitalism. And I think I just would want to suggest to us that that is kind of the emergent terrain that we need to fight on. It's not just against fossil capitalists, it's also against those who want to profit from the climate crisis itself and from the transition to renewable energy. And that's a big task, but um, but yeah, I'm real curious what other folks have to say. Thank you. And to all of you answering this question, feel free to get as, as personal or autobiographical as you want about you, you know, your own, how, how your own experience brought you to an understanding of this. Uh, how do you get others to understand that capitalism is not sustainable? Uh, Javier, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so how do we get others to understand that capitalism is not ecologically sustainable? Uh, thankfully, a lot of people that I interact with day to day and work with understand that. Uh, for the few who are still a little confused about it, I think there's two approaches that I take to talking about it. The first is uh, people understand that companies want profits. So it's very straightforward to talk about how, you know, no company is going to put the planet before profits. Like um, I think Shama Sawant said in that video, you know, the incentive structure is just not there if you're a fossil fuel company to prioritize the well being of the planet or, God forbid, human beings over profits. It's just not going to happen. And so at some point, we're going to have to restrain these companies. We're going to have to drag them kicking and screaming um, into a future where the planet is put ahead of profits. And the other major way I would say is to talk to people about this is to talk about what we do know. And this is probably the tack I would be more likely to take um, is to talk about, you know, what is it like in a rust belt town where there was a thriving industry and that went away? Or what is it like to live in a mining town where the resources have been extracted, the people's lives have been extracted and what's left is a whole lot of people who are, are sad, angry and bitter because realistically they have been used and discarded. And I talk with people about how that's how we're all going to feel. That's the reality we're all going to live in if we let capitalism, if we let this profit motive uh, determine what's going to happen as climate change accelerates. And I think people can relate to, people understand Hurricane Katrina, they understand the wildfires in California. Uh, in Iowa, where I grew up, people understand the derecho that just happened this last year, that you know, uh, straightforward winds that practically leveled the city of Cedar Rapids, which is a manufacturing town. Um, People really understand that. And I don't think it's too difficult to talk about what they do know to get them to understand why things have to change. For sure, uh, th thank you. Um, and I know like folks organizing in chapters all across DSA have some more conversations um, based on you know just things that are happening in real time for a lot of people. Uh, Marquito, what are your thoughts? 
how I came into this movement was facing the military industrial complex. And when I look at the community that I grew up in and the cancer rates and the health uh, effects from living um, next to a national priority Superfund site where chemicals were made to kill people and plants very effectively. You look at not just the, the industrial complex of the military, but also the industrial complexes around the world. So this is not just isolated to capitalism. We're looking at economies that's been based on pain and pollution. And they've been able to get away with not paying the price of pollution. And there is a price of pollution. Um, there's the price of remediation and there's the price of people's health. And so as, as when I look at reparations for the neighborhood that I grew up in, I am looking for economic reparations and also um, it also uh, reparations to make sure that our air, land and water is actually safe for right now and generations to come. And so I don't just see this as a capitalism problem. This is an industrial problem where companies and governments have been able not to deal with their waste. They've been able to dump it and, and make it invisible um, and make taxpayers or even the public pay the cost of pollution. And so as we shift that cost to corporations uh, where it should be, um, then it will become unprofitable. And then we can have an economy based on uh, where our earth is healing and we have those green renewable energies. And so we have to make sure that we say right now, we cannot say that it's profitable. It is unprofitable and they have to pay. Thank you. That, that's absolutely right. We're always trying to draw out the connections. Like this is not just a climate crisis. This is a crisis that uh, culminates from all these oppressive systems and the solutions have to address all of them at once. Uh, uh, Janae. What do you think? How do you get others to understand? Thank you. I'll go with something very Hawaii specific. So Hawaii was colonized by sugar and land holding corporations that still hold control of our islands today. The same corporations that overthrew the Hawaiian kingdom, like Alexander and Baldwin, remain the largest landholders and biggest political power brokers in the islands. Hawaii is extremely susceptible to climate change. According to a report that was produced by the Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission, uh, global sea levels could rise more than three feet in the coming decades, which could expose approximately 6,500 structures and tens of thousands of people statewide to chronic flooding. In addition, an estimated $19 billion in economic loss would result from the chronic flooding of land and structures located in exposure areas and 38 miles of coastal roads. And as a Native Hawaiian or a Kanaka 5,500 Native Hawaiian cultural sites are projected to be lost. Our entire state is under threat of increasingly powerful hurricanes. And to complicate matters even further, 90% of Hawaii's food supply is imported. And nearly all of our state's major food supply storage facilities are located in flood zones near the coast. So in an event of a natural, natural, a natural disaster, it's very possible that we have an estimated two to three days worth of food to feed every single person in the state of Hawaii. Um, Hawaii did just become one of the first states in the nation to declare a climate emergency. We've also set goals of becoming 100% reliant on clean energy by 2045. And we've taken steps to decarbonize our public transportation fleets um, and invest in clean energy generation. However, at the exact same time, we continue to allow the corporations and the developers to do whatever they want, regardless of the consequences for climate change and for public health. For example, the median single home price in the state of Hawaii is currently close to a million dollars. And that's, something that's been driven by unchecked development and an inability to tell political profiteers that enough is enough. In essence, Hawaii has just become a monopoly board for the wealthy in which policies that are passed to deal specifically with the climate crisis are only the ones that are supporting the existing economic structure rather than transforming it. And that doesn't work. We need structural systematic change. So I think it's important for people to remember and to understand that all systems of oppression, whether it's gender, racial, sexual, or any other, they all have an economic basis that are fundamentally rooted in power and are fundamentally about power. 
the reliance on the private sector and public-private partnerships only further entrenches corporatism as the economic model for our society. And that makes it incredibly difficult and even more difficult to move away from the economic systems that exploit people and our environment. So I think that that's one point that we really need to communicate more effectively to our own communities, that the systems that keep people oppressed in our society is the exact same system that is endangering our planet. And that ultimately is what will destroy both people and the planet if we don't create a more humanitarian alternative, which of course we all know is a Green New Deal. Thank you. I, I love how you were able to just zoom in on so many specific examples that draw out these intersections and then just, you know, give, give us the context. That's exactly, I think, the kind of communication that we're talking about here. Um, and uh, lastly, on this, Ruth, uh, what do you think? How do we get others to understand that capitalism is not sustainable ecologically? Gosh, um, I echo all of the previous speakers, um, especially the previous speakers. She's very <laughs> covered all the, the points really well. Um, Listening to her speak also reminded me of my upbringing and my um, indigenous cultural values. And there's a saying that says, um, you know, thinking when we plan, uh, we think seven generations ahead and also while honoring seven generations um, of our ancestors. And so to me, that's what really comes to mind or that's really at the center of things is keeping the people first and having a people-centered approach, which really encompasses a true humanitarian approach um, and really not doing harm to others. I know uh, my tribal nation specifically, um, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara nation, um, years ago, we had one of the largest um, trade centers in North America, um, but at the same time, there was no harm done to other people. And so I think that's really at the heart of, um, of sustainability is not doing harm to others. Um, and that includes each other, that includes the planet, um, land, water, air, and of course, wildlife. Um, so those are my thoughts. Yeah, that, that's such an amazing example and something that uh, is always worth pointing out, just like this is not capitalism is, you know, not something that has existed forever. It is a pretty recent development. And um, there are so many ways of living that societies have demonstrated for so long before this massive disruption. Um, so um, in explaining the need for a Green New Deal, uh, folks in the film like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talk about how uh, climate is uh, the, our greatest existential threat, and therefore we have to mobilize our entire economy around saving ourselves and taking care of this planet. Um, a bunch of you have already touched on this in your response to the first question, but what do you think a socialist Green New Deal entails, or an equitable, in, in your vision, uh, what, what does that entail, uh, Marquita? A Green New Deal makes sure that no matter who you are or where you live, you have clean air, clean water, and clean soil for right now and generations to come. And what I would like for it to look like, for me personally, that's being able to hop on public transportation for a night out on the town and, and have a car optional society and be able to get on a fast train and get across Tennessee uh, because it's faster to get to Texas than it is in Canada than it is to get across Tennessee. Um, it also looks like great paying jobs for, for industries that not only power our homes, but also clean our environment, building out our care economy um, and building out our social infrastructure where we have our elders and our people that are getting, um, that need help in their homes um, taken care of. That means having homes that, that have clean water and don't have to worry about lead. That means um, uh, updating houses where they can um, be energy efficient. And also no matter if you're poor or middle-class or rich, you have access to these green technologies right now. And so when I look at the Green New Deal, it also looks, uh, fixes, uh, the bridge uh, on I-40 that has a big crack on it and not just go towards uh, building a third bridge with two other broken bridges um, here in a, in a place that's logistical like Memphis, um, that means it's really important that we move towards, move away from fossil fuels um, because it's not just asthma, it's 
cancer rates, it's the refineries, it's the pipelines and all of these things, the coal ash is really affecting every part of us right now. And we can have something better if we invest in the technologies of the future that and make those more effective and efficient. And so we can all have clean air, clean water and clean soil. That's that's such a great vision. Uh, it's 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 so important to distraught like what it actually means for people's lives, not just talking about you know carbon whatever numbers that we want to make our policy around. Um, uh, Janae, what do you think a socialist green new deal entails? Thank you. For me, when I talk to constituents or to my colleagues or to anyone, I like to talk about replacing the corporation, the corruption that has been caused by corporate interests with a commitment to the public interest. For me, a Green New Deal at its core is about protecting both people and our planet. There are certain specific policies and ideas that I think are fundamental to a Green New Deal on which most of its proponents would agree. Um, and to me, first and foremost, it must eliminate our reliance on fossil fuels and we must advance clean energy. I think it needs to entail substantial public investments in education and green jobs initiatives so that people can move from carbon heavy jobs to positions that prioritize environmental justice. Uh, at an economic level, it must come with the fundamental social safety protections for working families like paid sick and family leave and a living wage for all. A single payer healthcare system that treats health as a human right is an essential component of the Green New Deal, especially coming out of the pandemic, where we've seen how broken our corporate healthcare system really is when it comes to responding to people's needs. I think as people transition from jobs that rely on fossil fuels to those that protect the planet, we need to have, we need to make sure that they can maintain their own and their families' well beings while they make this shift. And I think that's one of the things that makes universal healthcare so important and it's such an important part of a Green New Deal. I'm the first person of Hawaiian ancestry to ever represent my district. As a Hawaiian woman, I also believe that a Green New Deal should seriously take the practices of indigenous communities, um, take them very serious. When we know that these practices are ecologically restorative. Um, for example, one of the things that's incredibly important to my community is agriculture. In Hawaii, we often talk about the difference between local food production and regenerative agriculture. Corporations like Bayer and Syngenta have really greenwashed the term local food production uh, to make it seem like they're engaging in sustainable agricultural practices, which we know is not true. They're continuing to employ the exact same agrochemical processes that poison the aina, which is Hawaiian for land or the land that we stand on. Um, instead, my office has really tried to champion regenerative uh, agriculture practices, like those that have been employed by Native Hawaiians throughout and other Indigenous peoples throughout our histories. Um, I think these processes are not only anti-industrial, they actually work to reverse climate change by re like rebuilding organic matter, restoring soil um, and repairing biodiversity. Regenerative agriculture is fundamentally anti-corporate because it is intended to focus specifically on holistic health. It preserves traditional knowledge, it expands uh, public ownership, it democratizes access to resources and it puts people and the planet before the politics of profit which is what to me a green new deal is all about thank you and, and that's such a vivid example of what we mean by greenwashing um, and how corporations can you know talk about solutions in a way that might seem to you know folks who are vaguely sympathetic uh but uh really are totally the opposite uh ruth what do you think a green new deal entails i'm kind of again using my indigenous worldview lens um you know out of the 574 tribes that are currently in existence here on the United, what is present day United States, um, I can speak specifically to my tribal nation being a matriarchal matrilineal people. Um, and so that what that means is that women um, are held in high regard. And so prior to colonization, um, our women were always held in high regard, respected, um, and there's a direct correlation to how we treat our women and how we treat the earth. 
um, which is often termed or referred to as Mother Earth. And so for me, um, I think of like the, the gender uh, pay gap and how the there's a huge disparity in gender differences and the roles that we play, you know, as a state house representative here in North Dakota, I had a very interesting legislative session. Um, and so I think of in terms of misogyny and dealing with um, the disparities and the difference in values of how we treat our women. And so for me, I would envision the Green New Deal um, to also really encompass and uphold our women. Um, and, you know, that also will help prevent further tragedies from happening. Um, for example, the missing and murdered Indigenous women women, relatives, girls, two-spirit, and people, so. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's such a good example of how, you, when we're talking about, you know, universal policies like a Green New Deal, like they, they have to be responsive as well to all these historic systemic ongoing injustices. Um, Javier and then Miranda, uh, Dia, uh, what do you think a socialist Green New Deal entails? So when I think of uh, what does a socialist Green New Deal look like, um, I work in the energy sector and that's what I think about first. I think uh, about two major aspects of it. Um, the first is, is control and shifting from private ownership of the energy sector in any way to public control. And I do think there's a slight tension between the fact that the United States is, is a like settler colonial project, white society supremacist project and that this country is really more like an empire presiding over like the sovereign lands of many different peoples uh, and ideally we would have many different decentralized nodes of energy production and control on the other hand uh, the energy sector it's such a large investment in in capital to have um to have electrical power going, especially if you're talking about these sort of like slower, more sustainable energy production methods. I mean, that's why fossil fuels are so popular because you can light a match and get it going. A solar panel, you have to extract a lot out of the earth and manufacture an enormous amount um, to get that set up. And it's a lot heavier of an upfront investment. And so it tends towards a natural monopoly. And that's one thing that got me excited about Bernie Sanders's uh, Green New Deal proposal was this proposal to nationalize the energy sector to take it totally out of private hands. And there's a tension there with, uh, you know, nationalizing anything. What do you do if the United States is that nation? Um, so, so this question of control is very huge. And I don't think I have the answer to that. I think that answer will be worked out through further discussions amongst comrades, um, especially with the indigenous people of the so-called United States. Second thing that I think about when it comes to a socialist Green New Deal is the experiences of the workers that we're, that we're talking about in these industries. Uh, I work at a non-union uh, solar panel installation job and we are, we are exploited for low pay. We have very little control over our schedules. Uh, there are weeks where we only work 20 hours a week because our bosses control our schedule so tightly and because frankly they don't plan out in terms of our well-being and our ability to pay rent they plan out in terms of the company's ability to turn a profit um, our our bosses also threatened to fire our only black coworker um, because he talked about uh unemployment benefits in our work group chat and so we had to come together to push back against the boss to make to, to get those disciplinings away from our coworker, to make sure our coworker uh, felt supported and was genuinely supported. Uh, but that was a fight. And when people talk about investing in green energy, a part of me is like, I don't wanna see my bosses get any more money. I want that investment to be in the communities that have historically been most affected and that are projected to be most affected by climate change. So my, my uh, coworker, um, like I want him to have a say in what things are going to look like in the future. I want young workers of color to have a say and I want their experiences, our experiences to be centered in this. Um, so that's what I think about a socialist Green New Deal in the US context. But it, it wouldn't be socialist if it was just about the United States. 
there's an international perspective to all of these things we're talking about. For example, uh, some of the you know, exotic metals that are necessary for solar panels can basically only be mined in Congo. And these mines in Congo are not great places to be. I would not want to work there. Uh, and if I did work there, I'd be working alongside, in many cases, children that are forced to work there as well. And so when I think about uh, a socialist Green New Deal, there has to be international standards, international labor standards. There has to be effort put in by workers in the United States to stand in solidarity with workers across the green energy supply chain. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be a socialist Green New Deal. It is just going to be green capitalism by another name. That's a great answer. And I know it gets into territory that uh, Thea uh, often speaks to about internationalism and uh, public control. So Thea, uh, what do you have left to say? Yeah, what do I have left to say? Because um, so much, so many good points have been raised and I almost want to link where Mark Spita started us with this car optional society, which I love that phrase so much. Um, and in my work, I talk a lot about the issues with car dependency. Um, um, and I, I'm like thinking all the way back to then what Javier just said around those green technology supply chains, right? And how resource intensive electric vehicles are, right? So I think there's there's always, there's multiple reasons to fight for the same thing, right? So when we think about why we wanna favor mass transit, it's because it's more equitable, um, it helps desegregate the transportation system and, and our neighborhoods, but also because it's less resource intensive and it's more globally just, right? So I think that we can start to draw these connections around why we have certain demands and, and principles. Um, and I guess I'll just mention maybe a couple things that, that haven't been said and then resonate with maybe one thing that, that, that has. Um, another angle into what a socialist Green New Deal looks like is just thinking broadly about this total um, transformation of what our social priorities are, right? And as many people have already mentioned, we live in a really carceral and militarized society, right? So I wanna kind of bring in the movement for black lives um, paradigm of, of divest and invest, right? So like divest away from all of the, the negatives that people have brought up from militarism, from policing, um, from carcerality, and instead invest in this notion of care, which we've kind of heard about from a variety of the panelists. And we can think about care as caring for each other, as health care, as elder care, as child care, but also caring for nature, caring for the land, right? And so this big shift in, in priorities, I think that divest invest paradigm gets at it very succinctly. And when we think about popular education, I think it's also like an interesting, um, it's one that I think people can capture quickly. And then I wanna just say like a word more about internationalism. I'm so glad Javier brought it up. Um, and I already spoke a little bit to it, but but I do think just it's worth underscoring that that's a big difference between what I view as more transformative visions of the Green New Deal and ones that still redound to like basically a fundamentally nationalist understanding, right? And don't address the international consequences of the energy transition, don't address the global resource redistribution that are needed for climate resiliency elsewhere in the world, and don't address the fact that, for example, migrant rights are part of a Green New Deal, right? Because a Green New Deal, or rather, excuse me, the climate crisis is already involving historic levels of human migration within borders and across borders. It's not just cross border, it's also you know, from one place of a country to another. Um, and so we can think about like immigrant rights as part of a Green New Deal, and then that can draw our attention to, to housing and making sure that we have places to house people as part of a Green New Deal, and we can kind of connect um, those dots. And I just want to end by by saying um, something that is almost like a cliche at this point, but but I think it's also worth underscoring that the pandemic has shown us, I think, simultaneously how intertwined all of our faiths are globally, right? But also how, despite that fact, these systems of global apartheid are extremely um, enduring and enforced by all sorts of, of global powers. And so, like, you know, what we're seeing with, with what some call vaccine apartheid, and I think that's an apt name for like the deep inequalities of vaccine access is kind of a preview of, of climate apartheid, right? Which is already already exists, but is going to get worse in terms of the, the resources that different communities have available to them to be resilient to climate change, to rising seas, to extreme weather, and how unequally those resources are distributed across the world and how unjustly, because the places least responsible for, car for carbon emissions have the least resources to deal with their effects. So, you know, just thinking about how we can weave internationalism in 
And it's not like just some separate domain that's like across outside of our borders, but it goes all the way back to, you know, as Javier, as Marquito were saying, like, it goes all the way back to like how we think about our transportation system, right? That has implications for, for places, for South America and where lithium is, is extracted, you know? So just, I think being intersectional, both in terms of gender, race, class, um, and, and other things that we've been talking about, but also in terms of geography and seeing how we actually are connected across those borders. Um, but really amazing comments from everyone. Yeah, thank you, all of you. That's a really ex like appropriately expansive view of, of what we're talking about when we talk about a Green New Deal. Um, so I just want to ask one more question before we move into Q&A. I want to give folks here a chance to ask questions. Um, so several speakers in the film talk about how uh, one of the biggest barriers to change is the incredibly powerful and wealthy fossil fuel industry, uh, which it knows and has known for a long time that climate change is real, but keeps finding new ways to fund uh, different kinds of climate denialists because their sole goal is making profits. Um, and um, like one speaker, Kate Aronoff, uh, talks about how one of the roles socialists can play in responding to this crisis is to push forward equity because capitalism is always going to respond to this crisis in a way that protects profits, not in a way that protects people. Um, uh, Matt Karp talks about how in response to the crisis, we have to build a political movement that will transform the entire economy in a way that doesn't have many historical comparisons, but one of them is uh, the abolitionist movement, um, transforming the political economy of slavery uh, uh, over a century ago. So when we when we think about that massive scale of the crisis and like the massive barriers to it, um, what strategies do you think we use to organize a socialist movement, a mass movement of movements that's capable of winning such an enormous transformation? And how do we foreground equity of, of all kinds, economic, racial, gender, internationalist equity and in building this movement? Um, so there are a bunch of questions wrapped into it, but uh, answer however you want. Uh, Ruth, uh, what do you think? Gosh. Well, I think what comes to mind for me right away too is electing more, um, more pers fresh perspectives into every level of government. Um, I'm in the state house here in North Dakota, but I think of the um, potential that we have in policy change in every level of government. Um, locally, you know, from school boards, school boards to city councils to county commissions, city commissions, um, we need more fresh perspectives in those positions. Um, I think of um, even the language equity uh, sometimes isn't very receptive in um, in the political climate that I'm in right now. So. Uh, somebody had mentioned it earlier too, the messaging I think is important, but I think of uh, those who are least among us and who need the help the most and how um, pr their participation in the political process is needed, but oftentimes gets pushed to the back burner because they're just trying to survive or think of how they're going to feed their family, you know, in the next 24 hours or uh, keep a roof over their head. So, I think equity um, in a perfect world would be great to push for, but at the same time, um, a lot of the people that I interact with, um, equity kind of sounds like a far off, um, you know, like a Pleasantville type of a thing, you know, and so um, I think language is important, but again, getting fresh perspectives into every level of government is needed, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Marquito, what are strategies uh, that we use to build this movement? I think we come out with new fancy words to use each year. And so making um, the language where people can understand how it affects their lives. Like when you talk about equity and economics, you say um, um, incubators or money for people who have been directly affected by pollution to be able to not only lead in the new industries, but own it too. Um, and put it in terms where people can understand. When you talk about, um, you know, being in the Bible Belt, being a Christian or whatever, uh, some people think, hey, this is the end of the world, all right? And so we just gonna close the doors and wait on Jesus to come. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do as Christians. We are still supposed to steward the earth. And so we have a responsibility to make sure that we participate. And in the process is to make sure that not only 
that we're caring for, for our neighbors and our brothers and sisters, um, but also the earth. Um, and so when we talk about um, what's important to our economy, because our budget shows what we value right now, our military is the most funded part of our government. What if our educational system was funded just as well as our military system, right? What if our healthcare system was funded just as well as our uh, military system where everyone could actually be able to go to the doctor and not have to file bankruptcy the way I did. And so when I talk to people, I use real life experiences that they can connect to. Um, that's the reason why we were able to secure a seminant nomination with less than $22,000, right? I don't think that's been done before, but it was all because we were connecting with people on a, not only with relational organizing, but talking in a language where people can connect with. They have those personal experiences that, and they have those dreams of what they want their neighborhoods to look like. You go to anyone and any talk about any neighborhood at any educational level, they're going to say, I want more parks. I want more things for my kids to do. I want what's over there in the affluent neighborhoods. I wanna be able to go exercise. I wanna be able to go to work and not worry about losing my house because I don't get paid enough. When you talk to people, they tell you what they want. And so you listen first and then you connect it in a language where people understand. Cause these million dollar words that a lot of people pay that I'm still paying for um, because I got student loans, um, and we're, and just imagine if we had that educational system funded like our military. That's how we have a free educational system that actually foster ingenuity and creativity at all levels. Because right now, the way our system is, we are really killing our creativity and our ingenuity. It is stagnant and we can be better. Thank you. That's such a great answer. And I know um, I and a lot of other folks uh, here, I'm sure, are watching your campaign uh, and we're just like so impressed by what you were able to communicate and how, like in a Senate race of all races, like most people are not used to seeing Senate races push the boundaries of what's politically possible uh, the way that yours did. Um, uh, Janae, uh, what strategies do you think uh, we need to be organizing? Absolutely. I'm still nodding my head in total agreement with Marquita and all of the education emphasis because I'm like, yes, all of that is so needed. Um, one thing that I think we haven't really chatted about yet is um, the importance of making sure that labor and the environment are not pitted against each other as historically corporations, large corporations have done in the past. Um, and that's one of the things I think is the most beautiful about the Green New Deal is that it really brings the two together. Um, and I think that it's really important for us to bring new voices into the fold as we fight for climate justice and make sure that labor organizations are able to emphasize the things that most heavily impact them. I think it's incredibly important that we fight for both labor rights and a Green New Deal at the same time because labor rights are fundamentally a part of the Green New Deal um, and organized labor, using organized labor to fight for labor protections are essential to the Green New Deal's advancement. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of unions on a bunch of different issues from establishing paid sick and family leave programs to establishing a living wage for Hawaii's working families. Um, and gradually, Hawaii's unions have really been adopting environmental issues as part of its core mission. Um, the, for example, the Hawaii State Teachers Association um, has been advocating for climate change curricula in our schools. The Iron Workers Union has been championing buffer zones around landfills, which are oftentimes placed in impoverished and minority communities. Uh, the ILWU has worked with environmental organizations to author legislation that would call for good paying green jobs programs um, as part of our state's initiative for clean energy. I think that when labor organizations begin making environmental justice and climate change central topics to which they organize around and organize their members around, they bring immense power um, in achieving these goals. And the effects of climate change are felt in a lot of different ways, which is why it's important to have all of these different voices and on all of these different union members talking about how it impacts them and their membership. Global warming leads to hotter air in our classrooms that lack climate control. For instance, which in Hawaii is 
5,000 classrooms. Um, when classrooms exceed 100 degrees, teachers can't teach and kids can't learn. Teachers can organize and they have organized around this issue and they haven't just demanded air conditioning, they've also can demand things like a more comprehensive response to climate change that is the thing that causes overheating in the first place. Um, so I think that that's one of the ways that we can really utilize different voices um, to fight for the same end goal that uplifts both people and our planet. And then to talk about equity one more time, I think I said this in my first answer, but I think it's really important to say again, is that it's really important for people to understand that all systems of oppression, whether it's gender, racial, sexual, or any other have an economic basis that are fundamentally about power, racism, sexism, gender oppression, oppression of indigenous communities, and all other forms of oppression overlap with one another. And this happens because oppression is not just about the reproduction of discriminatory attitudes, but the continuation of social and economic systems that allow people who have power and resources to exploit those who do not. I think it's true that capitalism responds to the climate crisis and to inequality in a manner that defends profits over people. And in Hawaii, it's that's very clear in the way that Kanako Iwi or Native Hawaiians are treated within our own homelands. We very quickly, we have this thing called ceded lands or public trust lands, which are lands that belong specifically to the Hawaiian kingdom or belong to the Hawaiian kingdom that are now are supposed to be used to benefit the Hawaiian community. And Hawaiians are supposed to receive 20% of all revenue generated on these public trust lands. However, today we receive less than 4%. So I think that some elected officials this year have really made moves to undo deals that have been in place to provide even meager resources to Hawaiian communities because luxury property investors complained about having Hawaiian housing in their area and obstructing their oceanfront views. And I said on the House floor earlier this year that that's just a continuation of the colonization by the exact same people who overthrew Hawaiian sovereignty in the 1800s. The same people that still control and dominate most of Hawaii's political agenda and our campaign spending reports or the campaign spending reports of many of my colleagues. Um, it's also the same people though, that I think, who I think they're the same people who think nothing of environmental racism, of putting multiple landfills in minority communities to move solid waste out of rich areas um, and prevent any kind of real change overall. They're the same people who host racial sensitivity seminars in their workplaces, but lobby against the enactment of a living wage that uplifts marginalized people. So I think it's important for all of us to continue highlighting and addressing the the equity that both equity and climate and the climate crisis require transformational change, specifically doing away with a politics that treats people like commodities. And when we center equity with a regard to climate change, then we're saying that social inequality is produced by um, and is a part of the same financial system that is destroying our climate. And we are also saying that creating a more equal and democratic economic system will help heal structural racism and really advance our fight to resolve the climate emergency. Thank you for such a holistic answer. Uh, you you mentioned uh, organizing with labor unions and uh, Javier, uh, as, as a worker in an industry that is not unionized, uh, what, what st strategies do you think are very useful to organize the movement we need? Yeah. Um, I, I, I love what the other panelists have said. Uh, there's a lot that I don't understand. There's a lot of, uh, positions where I, I can't see, uh, what it's going to look like. There's some quote from some famous socialist about, uh, you know, in a socialist organization, you have to send your scouts out in every direction. You have to be able to tie all instances of oppression into a single coherent picture of of state violence and capitalist control. Um, I also want to shout out uh, Janae for, for just like incredible language, tying all that together and like rooting it in like the material reproduction of, of like the system of power that we have. That was just, um, but as far as strategies that I'm aware of for organizing a socialist movement that can, that can win this transformation and the role specifically of of, I want to talk about the PRO Act, uh, 
what role organizing for the PRO Act plays in this. So for folks who, who uh, have missed it, the PRO Act is a piece of legislation for Congress that would be such a huge overhaul of US labor law that would uh, really just like throw doors wide open for millions of workers to organize. I would love it. It would mean uh, it would make a huge difference in, in my workplace, in um, sort of the solar and, and green energy industry. Um, and, but, but in terms of like the work to, to pass the PRO Act, which you should look up exactly what it does, but uh, just even the work to pass it gives us, gives all of us the opportunity to connect with the existing labor movement, um, which Janae mentioned has historically been placed at odds with the environmental movement. And I'm going to put a little blame on the environmental movement because uh, where I grew up, I didn't care that much about environmentalism because that was a thing that rich kids worried about. And I was more worried about um, the holes in my ceiling or, or you know, that our car broke down again. Um, and talk about saving the planet just seemed so far-fetched. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, and, and now working in like a blue collar industry, um, most of us don't hang out with kids who went to, with adults who went to liberal arts colleges. And a lot of us are really turned off by, um, I don't know, uh, wool socks and Birkenstocks together. Um, and so I'm really glad to see this opportunity in the PRO Act and in the Green New Deal for, for these two movements that have had like different social bases really come together. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to connect with that labor movement as it exists, to connect with the environmental movement as it exists, to show how our goals align in this socialist vision and to push the boundaries and advance labor's expectations to advance the environmental movement's expectations. Um, yeah, that's what my sites are set on. And I really hope that like somebody on this, watching this, will get a job in solar and will organize their workplace. And then if you do, let's link up because we need a lot of that shit. Yes, love to hear it. Uh, that's that's absolutely right. And we want to spark as much of that as possible. Um, and Thea, uh, you can close this out in this section. What strategies do you think we need to organize? Speaking of the PRO Act. Yeah. I don't even know if I have anything to add to what uh, Janae and um, Javier already said and what everyone said, but specifically just on this piece about labor um, is, is what I was thinking about in, in answering this question. But I want to just mention one thing and then I'll come back to the PRAC, which is um, Javier just mentioned the importance of organizing workers in renewable and green sectors, right? And so that takes us all the way back to the beginning, but also the theme throughout around like green capitalism and those contradictions. And one of the key contradictions is that labor exploitation continues, right? And so, but it also is this organizing opportunity of like, we don't want to, we don't trust capitalists who destroyed our planet to, to kind of save us from, from the climate crisis. We need to organize workers in those sectors um, and see those as these sort of opportunities on the vanguard of kind of where the world is going um, uh, and, and build worker power in those places at the same time that we want to make sure that there's a just transition for workers in the sectors that we're phasing out, right? So that, that's the kind of tension and that's the difficulty, but I just wanted to kind of name that. Um, so Janae spoke really eloquently to this, ten, to both the tension between labor and climate, but also to those possibilities of organizing workers for, um, for climate justice. Um, and as socialists um, and eco-socialists, I think we know that at a very fundamental level, the trade-off between climate and workers or between jobs and environment is a false trade-off, right? Because there's no good jobs or any jobs on a burning planet. So at some level, this is a false and simplified trade-off. But at another level, like Javier was saying, there are real tensions that are born of, of, not, of, of maybe bad strategic decisions on both sides. And, and I think Javier was right to critique um, the, some of the strategies of big green environmental groups that really have not done enough work around labor. Um, but, you know, on the other side, we also know that the labor union has been decimated over decades, right? We have like a 6.4% unionization rate in private sectors, like in the sector that Javier works in, right? So we have this abysmal unionization rate. And, you know, whether or not we want to critique like the individual strategies of labor organizers, the point is that everyone's operating from this place of extreme organizational weakness. And so, 
what is to be done is the question. And it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, but we need to do, we need a mobilization that will force through labor reform that will allow millions to unionize, right? Which is in short, what the PRO Act does that paves the way for millions of workers to very quickly join unions, right? We have some of the most onerous conditions in the world for how difficult it is to, to actually join the union. Um, and that's an intentional corporate um, and political strategy over years. But then that's the chicken and egg question, like how do we create the mass movement that we would need organized workers to win? And historically, we've seen that winning those structural radical reforms comes from labor militancy among other types of militancy. And so what the what the D, what DSA has done with the PRO Act campaign along with our with our allies on that campaign is try to like address that Gordian knot and just say like we know that we need to build relationships with labor between labor and climate groups in order to open the pathway for millions more to unionize. And I've been as someone working with Ashik and with many other comrades on this PROACT campaign within DSA, but also with the Painters Union, with CWA, with Sunrise, with other groups, um, I've been personally astounded with what we've achieved. We haven't won the PROACT yet, right? So we need, we still, there's a lot more to fight for and folks should join DSA and join the campaign if they're interested in getting involved. But we have um, made 1 million phone calls which is a lot of phone calls. Uh, it's huge. I had I did not believe it when we said we would make five hundred thousand. I did not believe it when I when we said we would make a million. But you know, it's good to set those goals um, as um, as both Ruth and Marquita were talking about earlier. Like how you know the challenge of organizing insurgent campaigns and how you have to put that people power to it. You have to set goals and hopefully you know you meet them um, uh, through people being really inspired. So we've met those goals, but we've also done some real external some changes in the external landscape we with all those phone calls and with all of our pressure and mayday actions and all sorts of things we helped to move two u.s senators including mansion who's like unmovable on anything right i mean he you know we won't even get started on mansion because it's such a frustrating thing right now but he did co-sponsor the pro act from not right previously and angus king as well so so we've moved some u.s senators which you know if you ask me a few years ago as a socialist organization in the united states going to put enough pressure on senators in, in, in the US to change their votes on something, I would have said, no, you're crazy. But we've done that through the power of solidarity, through working with, with an inspiring vision that makes those connections between the labor movement and these transformative um, uh, paradigms like the Green New Deal that we need to fight for. So I'll just end it um, there. And I would love, I, there's a lot of interesting chat and Q and A, and I'm you know, excited to hear from folks in the room um, about what they want to ask about. Thank you, uh, all of you for such thoughtful comments. Um, so we we've got a little under half an hour left. I want to move into uh, audience questions uh, that, that folks have been dropping. There are a lot of really thoughtful ones. And I also want to bring Yell back into this conversation. Um, so, uh, all of you are welcome to respond to any of these uh, in any order. So just feel free to jump in. We can make this a bit more conversational. So uh, yeah, well, after hearing all these issues that have been raised in this first part, are these the kinds of questions that you hoped your film would raise about climate change and a Green New Deal? Like how, how did you imagine audiences responding to this particular segment of the film? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, in short, I mean, I'm just deeply humbled hearing um, all the different pieces um, and the connections that people are making um, about all the intersectionality that we need to tackle in order to address these. And that was definitely, um, like the film can feel a little um, scattered, I think. I mean, a lot of the reviews have been talking about how, you know, I, I talk about everything and you just throw in the whole kitchen sink, but you really have to um, when you're talking mm -hmm. about these issues and to just say, oh, I'm just gonna talk about this one single problem I'm just going to talk about economics or I'm just going to talk about unions and not be able to talk about it um, in the holistic way was really missing the point. So it's been such a, so yes, it's really great to hear everyone talking about these and to also be making all these disparate connections that the film, um, we tried to, to address and include, but it is, um, you know, it's hard. It's a 90 minute film. It really, you know, obviously like we're talking about one of the topics for two hours. Uh, there's so much um, that could be done, but it, it is, it's, it's tough. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to everyone and I'm, uh, I'm heartened to hear Thea, you know, talking about how much progress we made and be able to pressure Manchin and other senators and stuff. And it also just feels um, 
it's just so deeply overwhelming. Like, I don't want to say I'm depressed because this is, it's, everyone's being really smart, but I'm just like, oh, fuck. Like, there's just, this is a lot. Uh, how are we, how are we going to move forward? I know, I know I'm doing what I, what I can do with film. And that's something that's a goal of mine when we're talking about how do we, how do we move the needle? How do we change people's ideas and, and push discourse? That's something that I am trying to do with, with the film is, is, you know, not be preaching to the choir, but make something that's not going to be so dogmatic or, or intimidating, but something you could be like, oh, I see this. And now I see that's, that makes sense. That's not, um, that's something that is um, digestible, but, um, but it's a lot. We, we have a lot of work to do. For sure. Uh, so one question uh, that folks have is when will the whole movie be available? Great question. <laughs> um, we've been playing in film festivals and those have all been online. Um, I don't think we're playing at any festivals right now, um, but we are gonna have a theatrical release Labor Day weekend. Um, and so please do uh, find us on Facebook, on social media, or sign up to our newsletter um, on our website, which I believe is socialismmovie.com, um, where we will be doing a lot more um, outreach and impact as, as we move forward um, towards Labor Day weekend, trying to make sure we have screenings in your cities. If it's not, I mean, it's a limited release because it's a smaller independent film, but, um, but if you have a community if you're in your city that's maybe not one of the, the major ones, um, we would love to be able to do um, smaller screenings with you with you guys. So please, you know, send me, send me an email over those platforms. Um, and reach out and then it will also be um, online. I think we're doing theatrical and then also streaming release at the same time. So you'd be able to rent it as well on, um, on all those awful platforms. Yeah, well, you, you heard her. I know lots of people are uh, have not been to the movies in a while. So hopefully it'll be screening somewhere. And if not, we can find it on the internet. Oh yeah, um, hopefully it'll be safe in theaters Labor Day weekend, side note. I don't wanna pressure anyone to go to a space they don't feel safe in. So. Absolutely. Thank you for that intervention. <laughs> um, all right. So first question. Uh, so uh, let's try to keep the answers to, to these questions short. I know, like, I mean, just reading these questions, like we could talk for half an hour about each of them, uh, but just try to keep it to a minute or two if you can, and just jump in uh, with the answers if you have something to add. So the first question is from Kimberly Sh Sherwood, who says, uh, thank you for such a rich conversation. Uh, what would these panelists suggest are the one, two, or three early wins that you think uh, could catalyze the transformation we need? Um, and realizing that even early wins could be triggering, considering, uh, you know, just the political landscape, but um, just thinking about how do we bridge between where we are now and the future we need, uh, where, you know, a lot of progress could be made in ways that move the needle. So right now, um the decision on how much should be put on infrastructure. Um, if we do not put enough money on infrastructure, whether it be broadband, transportation, or um, dealing with our care infrastructure, then um, it's going to set us back. And so right now, that is, the, that is the most immediate win that we can put pressure on um, a, a, on all our US senators um, to make the right decision because what is gonna end up happening is that people who have lead in water are gonna to have to compete for grants in order to get lead, to get their pipes um, uh, delivery systems um, redone. So right now that is the most crucial thing is not to let them strip down um, the infrastructure because it will determine um, whether we go forward or continue to stay in the same place. Thank you. Uh, what do other folks think? What are the one, two, or three early wins that could catalyze the transformation we need? I'm going to jump in and say that um, I fully agree with Marquita, but I also think that another really important win would be making sure that we have a universal um, healthcare system because we need to make sure that people are taken care of, that they have their basic things, their basic life necessities taken care of from healthcare to housing to a living wage, and then the training, the educational training that they need in order to transition into this clean, green economy that we need um, in order to uh, protect our planet. 
So I would, I would definitely add the, the social infrastructure part into that as well. Thank you for sure. Anyone else? I know the climate infrastructure bill is the thing on everyone's mind who's paying attention to climate politics right now. Um, but is there anything else that you think uh, could be an important early win? We can get that pro act through, you know, let's, um, usually if it's a dirty workplace, it's a dirty community right next to it. And so the PRO Act is very important for healthy and safe communities around environmental justice. Um, when you talk about healthcare for all, um, that is a reparation for environmental justice, right? Um, why would you want somebody to have to pay for being polluted by having extra healthcare um, right now? Um, so we, we look at if we change the way our economy is based on pain and pollution and actually started investing in um, the technology to um, heal because our science of destruction has outpaced our science to heal and we have to make sure that we keep those in balance. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. And again, just like reinforcing that the Green New Deal is not something we'll win in a single bill or just in a single year. It's just a whole vision for the transformations we need. And like so many things like Medicare for all that are very important priorities are, are part of that vision. Um, so we have a more expansive question here from Kevin Hengehold. How does socialism solve climate change? Um, any equitable solution would involve a massive transfer of stolen wealth from the global north to the global south. I'm sure everyone on this call agrees with that, uh, but how do you convince the majority of those in the global north to give up so much of the wealth and resources they have now? Um, or if you think he's off base, let him know. What do folks think? Um, I'll dive in here. This is a complicated question because as we've already explored a lot, like they're um, the thinking about how a Green New Deal does or doesn't align with global justice is is complex. And 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 some of the reasons are, are I think the question is getting at. I guess one place I would comradely push back a little bit is the idea that all Americans like have an amazing standard of living and have like tons of stuff and you know are you know are just like over consuming, right? I think that if you break down every area of life, like when we look at housing, when we look at transportation, when we look at all forms of consumption, it's so unequal, right? Um, and transportation is a great example, right? It's actually a particularly very unequal sector in terms of how people even get around. As someone that personally, not during the pandemic, of course, but in my, in the, before the pandemic times, I flew sometimes, right? I for research and for conferences or whatever. And I, you know, I think just kind of assume like lots of people fly. In fact, very few people fly in the world, right? It's, it's, it's very unequal who has access to like buying a plane ticket, right? Or if they do, it's like the once a year or once two years thing to go to a wedding. It's not like constant. Wealthy people are like constantly flying. I mean, some of them own private jets, right? This is just a little example, but it's to just illustrate that, you know, if you are, you know, one mark of poverty in the US is not even owning a car, right? Is having to rely on our decrepit mass transit systems that haven't been invested in. And as Marquita said earlier, very eloquently, like we need to invest in mass transit so that that is no longer like a marker of status. But, you know, I'll put that aside for a moment, just to say that consumption is extremely unequal in the US and globally. Um, and so I think that I would not think of the Green New Deal as like lowering the average or ordinary working class person standard of living but in actually like making consumption much more equal as one starting point, but not by bringing everyone, let's say up to like really overconsumption affluent, which I don't personally believe brings happiness. I mean, we can get into another philosophical discussion about that, but it's not my goal for like every working class person to own a private jet. Like, I don't actually think that that is what builds community and happiness. And, and I'll put that, you know, as another, you know, we could dive into each of these topics, but the, the main place I would push back um, from that is not the critique of, of overconsumption and, and affluent overconsumption, but it's rather maybe the assumption that that is like equally shared by all Americans. And I, I don't think that it is. Thank you. Do, do other folks have thoughts on that? If 
not, uh, we can move on to another question that's a little more localized. Uh, Kenny Jones asks, uh, I grew up in Houston and work, work in, worked in the oil drilling service industry. Literally millions of people across the US and world depend on the oil industry and related in industries for their livelihoods. So what does the Green New Deal offer for these workers? So what not only does the oil industry needs, but also um, when you look at mountaintop removal, the coal industries, and pretty much all the fossil fuel industries need is a just transition where we have an educational system that supports workers to be able to go into those jobs um, that are comparable with pay that they're receiving now or even better. Um, and we also have to prepare for automation, people. Like a lot of these jobs are going to going towards automation and automation is not something that happens overnight. It, it happens um, slowly and people miss it. Um, and then it's like, hey, we don't have cashiers anymore. So now we have to take a step back to say, hey, we know that there's gonna be more automation and we know that right now that workers need to be prepared to be able to go into those newer industries and get those trainings and um and transferring into different industries um, where they can still have a good living and be able to have a safe workplace and join a union that's a great answer thank you uh, i saw javier raising your hand yeah um if you're working in an oil field and you're making like 100k a year or something I'll admit it's going to be hard as pulling teeth to convince you that you should like voluntarily quit that and get a job uh, installing solar. It would be a huge drop in your standard of living. Um, so, but what I can say is like, if you've been working that job for ages and you're like anywhere remotely close to retirement, you've been, you're 40 even, I don't care. Uh, yeah. Let's get you a pension for that because you've, you put in this hard work um, I think it'll be fine for everybody if you're able to chill out for a while. Uh, and if you decide you want to get into uh, a different sector of work, you can. Um, and absolutely, I don't know what the Green New Deal as written right now guarantees, but I know what it needs to guarantee is, is full educational support for everybody who wants to transition from a job in a very extractive industry to a new industry. And I want, I want to uplift here something that Marquita mentioned earlier, which is like care work. So let's say you've been, um, you've been working on an oil field or whatever, and you want to give something else a try. You want to try teaching or you want to try being a nurse. Uh, all of that work is so, so essential to the well-being of our whole society. Uh, and it really needs to um be like a central priority this sort of educational support and this centering of care work and these healing aspects of our society that are honorable respectable jobs um so that's kind of my take as a dude who's considered working in my oil field and uh sometimes i wish i could get that job because of its pay um but like ultimately none of us are gonna have jobs in that. So what are we gonna do? That's what we've gotta be able to do at least. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, and especially to bring in the care economy when we're talking about Green New Deal jobs is super important. So we, we have a related question from Mark Schaefer um, talking about how disruptive uh, uh, a just transition would be uh, toward a green economy, but also obviously climate change itself uh, is, is going to be extremely disruptive. Um, so um, either way, uh, people who've been left out of the economy so far are going to be hit the hardest. So the, one of the key ideas of the Green New Deal is the guarantee of a job and economic security um, for a just transition. So how, how can that be done in a practical way? Like, are there examples um, you can think of or like concrete ways that might be feasible to imagine? I think 
that there are a lot of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this quick because I just saw Janae also unmute herself and I, I want to hear what others have to say, but there are historic examples, of course, right? So like during the New Deal, there was a huge expansion of guaranteed work um, in all sorts of fields, right? Um, everything from building infrastructure, but also artists and like book binders and librarians and care workers. And it, if when you dig into the history, it's really interesting, like the vast array of types of jobs and work that were valued during the New Deal. Um, and unfortunately, of course, a lot of those programs don't exist anymore, though they did build, you know, some of the, the world around us. Um, uh, and now I think that there's a bill in Congress up to expand and renew the Civilian Conservation Corps and kind of hire lots of young people or anyone, not that it's necessarily just for young people, I'm just thinking of Sunrise is, is mobilizing for it a lot. Um, but in order to do um, lots of work, but including especially like ecological restoration work, right? And so we can even think of that in a just transition kind of context, considering the specific communities that have been harmed by fossil fuel extraction, other forms of, of pollution, what it would look like to actually hire people to remediate the ecosystems around them. So I think there's some historic example, but they would definitely need to be like rethought for the current moment and what types of work we need and, and what's essential right now. Just to add in there, I think one of the most important things with, with the transition is that we have to make sure that we're providing free college and free job training um, for people as they transition into, into, new, into new green jobs. Um, and I think another really important factor is that we also really need to talk about eliminating student debt. Um, so that people are no longer thinking about or have this looming things over their head as they are transitioning. And I think that's probably another piece of this that we need to talk about because the Green New Deal, I think in all forms, and that's one of the most beautiful things about it, is that it's all forms of equity, social, economic, and environmental. And we really need to rally people around uh, that idea to really form this movement. Thank you. Uh, so we are nearing 930 Eastern and we still have over 100 people on the call and a bunch more questions. Uh, if folks want, uh, we're happy to stay on a little bit longer. If, if any of panelists have to drop off in the next few minutes, that's totally fine. And thank you for being here. Um, but uh, I can keep asking questions uh, for at least 15 more minutes. <laughs> um, so one question from Michael Broyles is that uh, a lot of us uh, believe that a big part of dealing with the climate crisis is obviously mass organizing and mobilization through labor organizing. Uh, does anyone have insights into how we build the labor coalitions that we need to save our planet? And we've touched on that in a bunch of ways um, through the PRO Act and specific uh, labor union uh, relationships folks have been building, but does anyone have more thoughts on that? Or maybe a way to reframe it is like, how do we connect labor organizing to other movement organizing that we need to build the, the broad intersectional movement that we need? I'll just say a little bit here while, while other folks are gathering their thoughts. I think that some of this I might have already addressed, but one thing that I didn't say is that um, I know from our comrades in the building trades and in CWA that we've been working with pretty closely on the PRO Act um, campaign that DSA being involved, socialists being involved, people would like this very clear political vision, right? Because we also have to think about decades of separation between the left and labor, right? Through McCarthyism, through the Red Scare, literally through state repression, um, eliminating leftists from the labor movement, right? So just even reconnecting those threads is important. Um, but then the fact that it happened to be DSA with its vision of the PRO Act being part of the Green New Deal, right? So we had, it was like the PRO Act and then this is what we're fighting for. And what I've heard, and it's anecdotal, but you know, it's meaningful to me is that from folks in the building trades and in CWA, that that has actually helped to move members and organizers in those unions to seeing themselves in the Green New Deal. Like the Green New Deal is not something we're opposing, but something that you know painters and electricians and construction workers are gonna help to build. And we should be fighting for this and fighting for workers' rights as a part of that vision, right? So I'm not saying we're solving this overnight, but like through those relationships and through demonstrating that you're showing up for people, I think that that people can be moved. Like there's no reason to assume that that you know that that like someone in the building trades is going to hold on to the idea of a pipeline being the only you know thing that they can imagine themselves building, right? Um, um, just just to take an example. But but I so so I think 
showing up, doing, doing the work and having conversations and just like reconnecting those dots between the left and labor are, um, I do think have tangible effects. We need to like speed that up though, right? We don't have a lot of time to win a green deal, but, but I think that that's where it begins. For sure. Uh, I could uh, yeah, chime uh, in here at that time. Uh, so uh, I'm going to kind of throw, throw the gauntlet uh, down for the people on the call watching this call. I'm going to say if you are employed for a wage and you do not yet have a union at your workplace, I would strongly suggest joining or getting more involved in a socialist organization and working with those comrades to learn how to organize your workplace, to organize you and your coworkers into a union so that you have those kinds of legal protections so that you can put pressure on the capitalists that you interact with most often in order to influence the capitalist class to give us what we need before we take all their stuff. Um, because like, we can think of the labor union as just a bunch of white dudes uh, with with beards in their like 50s who swing hammers at uh, beams of steel. Um, but that's not the reality of what the working class looks like. The working class in the United States is is disproportionately and increasingly uh, black, brown, non men, uh, queer. So. If, if that if any of that resonates with you, uh, <laughs> yeah, organizing organizing a union at your workplace, or if you're part of a union, uh, doing some organizing work within that union to shift where people are at is huge. And we're going to need a lot of that in order to win the things that we're talking about. It sounds really big, and that's why the first step is getting involved with your socialist org, because then you have comrades to turn to and be like, holy shit, this is really hard. And they're like, yeah. Thank you for bringing it to the institutions that people spend the most of their time in, uh, the workplace. Um, there's a follow-up question that somebody has for you. Uh, could Javier speak a little bit about a little bit more about your experience in the solar industry, about the difficulty of unionizing, and your thoughts about how to build union solidarity, specifically in renewable industries? Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, how do you think uh, union solidarity can be achieved in the solar and wind industries as part of the Green New Deal? Yeah. Um, I'll say that, at least in my experience, in my workplace, we're all aware that the IBEW, that is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, exists. Many of us want to be electricians. Um, but the union is, in my opinion, a little close-minded about the shops that they decide to organize. Um, and so there just aren't enough spots for us all to get apprenticeships in the traditional electrical route. So a lot of us got jobs in the solar industry because it's relevant. And uh, we are a bit more determined to, you know, take our, our 15 minute breaks at work and push back a little bit against our supervisors because we know that there's a union and that does give us some wiggle room. Um, but I would say the biggest thing in, in the instance of um, our bosses threatening a coworker because he mentioned uh, unemployment in our work group chat, um, thankfully, like, because I uh, talk with and listen to my coworkers, I had a good relationship with this coworker. So even though the bosses told him, hey, if you tell anybody that we're threatening to sue you, um, then we'll sue you for talking to them, which is defamation, um, which I knew, thanks to comrades of mine, that this, this whole scheme that the bosses were talking about was illegal. And thanks to actually listening and relating with my coworker, he felt confident sharing what was going on with me. And so together, he and I collaborated um, to come up with an idea of kind of walking the walk of a union before we necessarily have that legal recognition of a union. And through that experience of, you know, the bosses try to have a, a pizza party to pacify us. And at this little pizza party, we called out the problem to their faces, uh, shared what was going on with everybody, really put the heat on the bosses, uh, and they caved. Um, so we, we won. 
And through that experience of talking with all of our coworkers about everything, we built up a level of solidarity in our workplace that didn't exist before. Um, and I, I hope that that story can, can help illustrate how we can begin to build solidarity within these workplaces. Um, Absolutely. That, that's a great story. I mean, for, for a lot of folks I know who are not in union or, you know, who hear about it, but don't have direct experience of it, it just it's it's really great to just hear about like how how organizing has worked um, in people's workplaces. Um, and yeah, just like concrete examples of, of the struggles that workers face. Um, the next question is for the folks in office on this call. Uh, Randy Cunningham uh, uh, says that in Ohio, a big challenge is that anti-protest legislation in the state legislature uh, that's been passed and proposed in response to anti-pipeline protests and Black Lives Matter um, have, have been increasing. So could the folks who are in state legislators talk a little bit about the national drive uh, repressing protest and the freedom of speech? Um, I'll jump in first because I feel like here in Hawaii this past legislative session we actually had something very similar come up. Um, we had an ALEC bill come up um, in Hawaii that actually came in front of one of the committees that I had and my office manager picked it up immediately. We had no idea that it had even been introduced, much less was going to be heard, um, and we mobilized immediately. And I think the reality is that whether it's um, environmental racism bills or bills that are anti-protest or anti-abortion that are popping up all across our country, we have to make sure that we mobilize immediately the second we find them. And I think a lot of it should fall onto as well some of the legislators that see these bills come up before they're even put on a hearing notice. And we reach out to our comrades and to our community members and our, to our constituents as quickly as we possibly can to get opposition testimony out. Um, and that's one of the things that we really focused on. Um, it is unfortunate that these things are popping up and that we have to deal with them. But I think the reality is that there's gonna be negativity all the time. And this battle for a Green New Deal, um, for economic and environmental justice is an uphill battle. And I think we all know that. So like, I think Javier was the person that said, um, join in your uh, in your city's in your city's DSA and and get connected so that you don't feel like you're alone um, when you're fighting these battles. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. Um, in 2017, there were a package of uh, DAPL legislative bills that came out here in North Dakota. I was not um, an elected official at that time. I was actually doing an independent uh, small contract with the ACLU of North Dakota, and I was on the ground at the uh, resistance camps in South, uh, Standing Rock. Um, and so we provided a lot, a lot of uh, opposition testimony to these bills. Thankfully, a few of them died. Um, one of them still came back. One of the bills still came back in the last legislative session, so in 2019. It was reintroduced, but kind of disguised as a um, private property rights bill, but still had underlying uh, themes of uh, anti-protest or the right to gather or convene. Um, and that again died. It was reintroduced in the final hour right before we signed he died in 2019. Um, and then again, another property rights bill came up this past legislative session, but was went through a series of amendments. Um, but still very um, watered down, but not as uh, extreme, I guess you could say, as it was in 2017 with that package of DAPL bills, including the right to convene or protest, um, even a pedestrian bill that we had killed as just citizens, not just citizens, but just you know as citizens at that time, uh, which would have made it legal to run over pedestrians. Uh, which really had some huge unintended consequences, especially for our rural tribal communities in North Dakota, where a lot of people still walk in between um, communities on, on the sides of roads and highways. Um, so yes, it's still it's still very much alive and well um, here in North Dakota. We're a very red state and a very pro-oil um, extractive fossil fuel industry. And one thing I wanted to mention too is really to um, make mention of those who are currently on the front lines right now, um, not too far away from 
Fargo, North Dakota, you know, you know, in uh, north of Park uh, Rapids, I believe, or um, in Minnesota, Park River, excuse me, um, at line three. So we have a lot of um, people there who are working on the front lines and, and fighting hard so that we can have clean air, clean water, um, and clean soil. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so important to just point to the ongoing struggles. Like this is not, um, you know, the climate crisis is no longer a future thing uh, for many people. It hasn't been for a long time. And um, for, for plenty of folks, especially indigenous people within these borders, it's uh, just a continuation of uh, a long legacy of, of harm. Um, so on, on that note, uh, I think this closing question um, is, is a good segue uh, from uh, Purnima Data. Every day we're getting closer and closer to a point where it may be impossible to save the world that we have now, or at least many aspects of it. As important as it is, organizing around climate change can be very hard. So how do you keep your hopes up? What keeps you going with this kind of work when it seems to be getting harder every day in a lot of ways? I thought it was impossible. Um, I would have never got started because really to tell you the truth, when I first got started, I looked at my mom and my dad organized and I was like, you're organizing against the military, the best funded military in the world. What could you actually do? Um, uh, and they showed me um, what the power of organize and what the power of we looks like. And so what makes me hopeful is that we have different people coming to this space. Um, we have people who may not believe in socialism that, that are walking arm in arm with social socialists to talk about what they want their communities to look like. My campaign brought Republicans, Democrats, socialists, um, uh, the Green Party, uh, and independents all alike. And so what gives me hope is the power to connect people to fight for what's right and know that justice is what we shape it right now and what justice is 30, 40, 50 years from now is going to be what our children and children think justice should be. And so right now it's our responsibility to, to fight for justice because somebody started fighting for environmental justice 18 in the 1800s when it was about farm farm workers um, being polluted. And so that's where um, environmental justice has roots in. And it's not just some people like to start it as an early fight within the last 50, 60 years, but it's always been tied to the land. It's always been tied to workers. It's always been put in communities where um, industries have been zoned to be places. So what gives me hope is when people like you and me can start being on the planning boards that can look at the model of TVA and make it better so we can have a national model uh, that, that provides, uh, that delivers um, energy and looks at flood control and everything that it was, that it was supposed to do at, in that act. So right now, what gives me hope is people and we have the power. Thank you. Fantastic answer. Uh, what do other folks think? What, what, what keeps you going? It's hard to follow up with that because I agree with everything. Um, and I love like this long historical, like people have been struggling for so many years and, and, um, and I think that we can find inspiration from that. Um, I'm going to be corny and personal, which is that I think what gives me hope is the people that I work with in DSA, like, I mean, that really truly, Ashik is one of them um, and, and many others that, you know, since um, 2017, we've been working to um, uh, think about what eco-socialism looks like today, to think about how we can radicalize the Green New Deal, to think about what public power and energy democracy looks like, right? All of these questions that when I first started, I didn't even really understand a lot of them or how they connected to one another, right? But but I've learned a lot and I, you know, I think that it's important to enjoy who you work with and enjoy working with them, right? And to sort of draw strength collectively. And that um, that's certainly what gets me through like the depressing moments and also like the boring moments. Like a lot of organizing is, is there's boring, you know, there's stuff you have to do that's not fun, <laughs> you know, email lots of people, remind them about things, whatever. So for me, it's about, um, there's a lot of sources of inspiration. Like when I see an amazing, you know, left-wing candidate win anywhere in the world, I get inspired, right? Not, not just in the US. So, and we have some recent 
you know, cool news over the past year in, in Latin America, a few interesting victories. So, you know, stuff like that gives me hope. But I think really what keeps me going on a day to day is is the comrades that I that I work with. Um, so um, and I'm sure that's true for, for many or all of us. Um, yeah. Thank you. And yeah, shout out to Pedro Castillo and every everyone in Peru who made uh, fingers crossed the victory possible. Um, other folks, what keeps you going? Um, just to continue to echo the, the sentiment that I think everyone has shared is that there's so much power in people. Um, and being a young Native woman, I have really come to recognize that representation truly does matter. And that if we want to see change, then we have to see people that come from their own communities that reflect um, the feelings and the pain and sometimes suffering that those communities have dealt with. And they have to be able to bring that into the halls of power, if you want to call it that. Um, but you have to be able to bring it there and to be really steadfast in your truth and be willing to take the hits to be honest about the, the needs that people deserve um, and that they are so the change that they're so desperate for. Um, I, there's a, I ran twice um, and I finally got my seat, um, but there's a quote that actually really inspired me to run the second time. And it was that um, when you walk your district, your kupuna or your ancestors walk with you. And for me, I feel like I've really embodied that. And every single day that I walk into the state capitol, I think about them. I bring my ancestors and their history and my native Hawaiian culture and values into the state capitol with me and I fight for that. And hopefully one day if I have children, my children and everyone else's children as well. And I think that that's really the sentiment having our ancestors with us as we walk into any place that we walk into um, and knowing that we're fighting for, for people and the people that, that need change and so desperately want it. And that's really what keeps me going and gets me out of bed every single morning. Thank you. That, that's a beautiful answer. Uh, Ruth, how do you keep your hopes up? Gosh, um, I would say my children. I'm a mom. I have four children. Um, but also echoing um, Janae's, Representative Capella's um, comments also in really um, thinking of the ancestors and thinking of um, the struggle and the sacrifices that were made for us to be here today and that it's still it's our responsibility to uh, live the best life we can in helping and serving others. Um, I think of the 215 young Indigenous children that were found, you know, the graves that were found in Kamloops, um, Canada, you know, at the residential school. Um, my daughter recently graduated. My firstborn child just recently graduated high school, and she's the first uh, within our household or within my family, immediate family. Um, she is the first graduate or first child, first generation that hasn't had to go to a residential school or a boarding school. Um, I did, my mom did, my grandparents did, and so, um, and that's a result of, you know, poor policy, years and years of poor policy. And so what keeps me going is really just trying to, trying to move the needle towards justice a little bit further. Um, so thank you, Madza Oh, uh, th Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, Javier, close us out. What, what keeps you going? <laughs> Uh, all right, no pressure, no pressure. Um, what keeps me going? My cat, Junior Varsity, looks really cute in her little vest that I put on her that she hates. Um, my my friends that I get to see, I, I live in, in St. Paul, land of 10 million lakes, and um, I get to go to the beach with my friends and, and it's just really nice and we get to live our, our our lives so far uh, without climate change absolutely wrecking everything. Uh, and I really wanna keep it that way when it's nice. Um, there's also an amazing uh, native community in, in Minneapolis called Little Earth. And um, it's just like another neighborhood. And I, I drive uh, through there all the time. And, um, you know, I've been on the streets with these people. I've, these people have had my back and I've had theirs. And knowing that they've been fighting these same extractive, exploitative forces for 500 years, uh, 
is, is really inspiring. I'm not indigenous myself. I'm not native myself, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm able to lend a lot more of myself to, to this struggle than a lot of other people are. And uh, others have mentioned, you know, international comrades successes. And um, I'm, I'm Venezuelan American. And uh, when I see successes of our comrades in Latin America, that gives me so much hope. When I see uh, the comrades in the Philippines fighting against their far right uh, dictator running the Philippines, um, or the successes of comrades in like Vietnam or, or across the third world and across what we across what we call the first world too. Um, I don't have to save the whole world. Uh, I can I can just work with my friends and my communities and my comrades and others will have my back and I've got theirs. Uh, and that's what keeps me going. Wow, that is a really perfect note to end on. Um, I'm afraid our time is up. I know I personally could, like I'd love to keep talking to all of you about all of this. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate everyone who made this space possible for us to have this conversation. Uh, thanks to everybody who was involved in, in organizing it. Uh, the filmmaker, Yal Bridge of the big scary S word. Um, our, all our fantastic panelists, um, our co-sponsors, um, you for being here, and especially to those of you who stayed overtime. Um, and if you are a member of the audience who signed up for this, you will be receiving follow-up emails about this and, and upcoming events. Um, and also thanks to all of you for your great questions and comments. And um, thanks especially to everybody who you can't see on the screen right now who have been working very hard behind the scenes and for weeks to make this possible. Uh, Sunshine Roy Anian Lutter, uh, Michael Bennett, David Duhalde, and Priscilla Yevarino from the Democratic Socialists of America Fund, and Flynn Murray of Descent Magazine. Uh, thanks to all of you. Um, so the panelists uh, here have given us a lot to think about tonight and some direct actions that we can take uh, to follow up to combat climate change and to fight for a Green New Deal. Um, we're going to send a follow-up email to this event, including a link to this video that will be housed on uh, the YouTube channel of the Democratic Socialists of America Fund. And I believe it's also live streamed to Facebook of uh, Descent Magazine. So please subscribe to the channel of the DSA Fund, share the video widely, and you can get involved in plenty of the opportunities you have to organize after this. So thank you everyone and good night. Solidarity.